So let's start recording this. So welcome to New Zealand. Kia ora. <laughs> uh, so session on collaborative literacy. So first of all, what are the known resources that we have on the wiki? There's, there's a couple of pages. What I'll do is, uh, because collaborative literacy is so important, I'll do uh, like literally like a whole manual for how you collaborate. I mean, it's like a standard procedures for what we do. Right now it's found on a couple of pages. We have a page called collaborative literacy. So let me share my screen. Um, so we're recording. Well, since nobody joined us here yet, but I can still no, nah, just cancel that since nobody's uh, listening besides us here. A couple of pages. So there's a page called on a wiki. Once again, the first first thing is like, okay, what's the wiki? First of all, it's a public, collaborative, editable, real-time platform. The way things are titled there, it's first of all like to get all on the same page: wiki.opensourcecology.org slash wiki, and then it has page name slash page name. So you go to like, for example, if I say that on the collaborative literacy page go to slash collaborative literacy there's so in the under collaborative literacy let me see are we recording here yes we are so under collaborative literacy we have a couple of assets there's a, there's a webinar you might want to take a look at because this is like, like as I say about this in a in a steam camp, we put in a lot of knowledge into the packet into a, a short time period. It's only like the first expectation is to say that hey, it's only a beginning. It's like what you get out of it is really. Oh, someone someone join us. No, oh. <laughs> okay. It's really like, do you have a clear motivation for doing this? Like, if you're going to work, want to create a business producing 3D printers, teach people, or start a micro factory for yourself, or go deeper with it. We, we pre present you with some basics, but what we present here is just scratching the surface. So the first expectation is it's really like, do you have something that you want to get out of it? Because as far as what you can get out of it, it's, it's a lot. It's the idea that we're trying to get a lot of people working together through a package of multiple elements. So there's the STEAM camp on one side, which is like basic boot camp literacy training. In this STEAM camp, we don't have the five project days where we apply the things like you're printing, you're uploading to the wiki, you're possibly doing circuits that you're milling, um, plotting, like plotting circuits, but primarily with a 3D printer. You can do a lot with off-the-shelf parts and a printer. You, there's a lot of prototyping, but the bigger part is also the collaborative aspect where you're constantly uploading things to the wiki, putting that into FreeCAD. The cool thing about the printer is that, say, you're, you know, we got a design sprint to make a car, you know, uh, which, which is what we see. Like In the future, if we have a number, like say 20 of these events at the same time with like 20 people each, like 400 people, you can, in principle, say, okay, and during the Steam Camp, we can prototype a lot of it, but maybe, like, after the Steam Camp, we could have a thing where we all get together into one location to actually build it or something like that. But the idea is, it is about much larger development by collaborative effort. So, start with the Steam Camp, the five project days in there. That builds into, we have these intense three-month-long design and build sessions at Factory Farm, which is our facility where we build the things like the tractors and the actual houses and the large printers and the metal printing printer and CNC torch tables we actually prototype in metal and plastic so that feeds into that and that, that feeds into the incentive challenges um, as the grand uh, kind of grand finale where we get a lot of people collaborating through an incentive that's mon you know, monetary reward but it's more about like the the way those things work is that people spend more effort than you give the prize for, clearly, like by a factor of 10 or 100. People will spend so much effort uh, to compete in that. But for us, we, we skew the rules to collaboration. And there's a very interesting point about that because when you look at the HeroX platform, or pretty much any platform out there, uh, it's a competition. We have a bunch of teams working against each other. But what if you skew the rules so that everyone is actually working together and uploading constantly so you can think that okay there is that possibility but 
interestingly it has not happened like if you look at go on hero x right now there's hundreds of projects you will not find a single one where they collaborate do that look at it in fact you look at the rules you say that they say you'll be disqualified if you copy from others so okay well that's a that's a shift in mindset so we're talking about this mindset where it's not a dozen or a couple of people part collaborating like the two pizza team at Amazon or whatever no it's global it's thousands of people so if that's the case we need to use the tools that allow us allow us to do that effectively and things like wikis and freecad and repositories uh, cloud editable Google Docs which we use currently like Google Docs for example are not open source but there is no currently there is no really good Google Slides alternative that we can use very effectively with a lot of people. So, uh, so there's there's that idea that we're talking about large collaboration. There's also the idea of university chapters, where um, think about that we're not just having chapters that do one thing. Like a typical, maybe you know, you might have engineers without borders. Okay, one team goes to Ghana, another one goes to Costa Rica or whatever. No, we'll all collaborate on one big project where it's going to be something greater. Like, let's solve a problem. Like, okay, let's develop a hydrogen car. You know, let's solve the afforestation issue or the housing issue by providing low-cost modular housing to everybody. Like, I mean, there's technical solutions, but of course, it's you know, it's much deeper than that. But at least on a technical level, we're saying, okay, if we can eliminate the material constraints from affecting what we do, like how we make a living, then you can make a better world for everybody. So we start by, first it's that vision, the collaborative literacy, which to me is the, like the number one thing that's missing uh, in people, because people are just, ne nowhere are you really used to, like, you know, for example, your company, you guys are not going to share your, your stuff with others. Possibly if, if that did happen, then the whole industry could be brought up in terms of the kind of products that are possible to happen. Like, for example, uh, you know, some related industry might, might be making straw board from grass or, or biomass. Like imagine that technology, like right now you go to the hardware store, you get, you know, your plywood panels. What if that technology was available that anyone, like anywhere could make this construction material that's really good because we all collaborate on it. Things like that, just solving uh, bigger problems. Uh, so we talk about scales of thousands of people potentially. There's the OSE university chapters, which we're trying to get uh, uh, spawned up like a lot of times the discussion comes about like how do you work with the universities definitely that's that's worth doing but I think the way to crack that nut is to have every because it's a huge coordination question right so how do you crack that nut and I think the the way to crack it is um, the collaborative literacy the idea that first of all you can work on a bigger project you do have the tools and then selecting bigger projects that are beyond any single team that's the other component and then the role division, just like in software, Linux was solved by the ability of people to make, to work on many, many parts at the same time and using repositories, like high modular breakdown. That's the key. So for modular breakdown, you can break the technology down into very small parts, but you can also break the teams down into very small parts. Like for this event, um, you know, we can start drawing up a list of like 100 people that can contribute meaningfully. Like another one would be, like say the AR instructionals where you take a picture of that and through AI it will tell you hey that thing is actually not right there you know things that's like an advanced level of information architecture that you can have in this but all of those things require uh, a lot of effort so there's there's the even the AI assist there's the IKEA style fabrication drawings there's like the plain manual there's video instructionals there's just the technology refinement, there's production engineering, everything. You know, you can have like full, there's, there's electronics in there, there's mechanics in there, there's thermal, thermodynamics in there, and all of those, you can break this into teams. And so the point is, you can create a whole collaboration architecture where a lot of people are uh, doing the development, and then taking that to to, okay, can we be actually working on a STEAM camp itself? Okay, so how, we, how do we develop that model to train people, to get the operations on that, to get the logistics proper, to get all the details that go into running that enterprise? So, uh, bottom line, you can turn one project into this massive effort 
with many many people working on it together and uh, I think it starts with taking on bigger projects, bigger problems, like, because if you have a big, hairy, audacious goal in mind, this is kind of like the, from Peter Diamandis, this is speaking about, like, the exponential organizations and how do you really motivate people. There's a really good book I mentioned that is called Bold, like how to use crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and crowd innovation and all of that, like the incentive challenge idea, actually, I got that from the book named Bold. Uh, the guy who founded the X Prize, so basically, like, global grand challenges, big issues that are worth working on. There's plenty of them, but most of us kind of reduce ourselves to, okay, there's like more mundane things that we have to do to make a living, but there's certainly a lot, a lot of good work to be done, and we have to start at the level of inspiring people to work on such, such issues, and, and then there's the tools, the, the actual tools that you can use. So for those tools, uh, we have a bunch of tools. So, so on the wiki there's a page called uh, it's called OSC Collaboration Protocol. So what are the basics? I mean the basics that anyone can can do like for this event the things the kinds of things we want to do is people documenting stuff on the wiki. So so get an account so we know that wikis like Wikipedia are highly scalable you can have thousands of people on it, hundreds of thousands of people col collaborating. And um, how, do you, how do you keep track of where everything is? There's two things. There's people that are involved, and then there's the actual content that's involved. For people, say we've got this team, like say we're working on it full time, we're developing like with the other Steam Camp instructors. Each of us has a log on the wiki, like a log where you just keep track of all that you do. So, um, so that somebody else looks at your log and they can go like that, okay, this person did this. So how does a log look? First of all, there's an effort graph where we see how many hours are being contributed. So right now we're at about 250 or so, maybe. Did or, you get into your log? So I go to March and log. So the log, the, the nomenclature there is, okay, so the page name is Ian Log. So you start that, you first of all get an account on a wiki um, I just embedded this overall time graph. Each person, actually, we have this time sheet. So, for example, this is my time sheet. I just go right in there and every time I'm like, at, you know, working like 80 hour, 70 or whatever, 80 hour weeks. But here, just um, put in your hours for the tasks. Um, but that all gets fed into this overall graph. So you can see... Um, I've got tabs. I got that's part of the thing. Make it easy, like my my log. But how do you parse? Like, say I I do all that I do. You can completely follow everything that I've done in a day. What I do is, uh, and that's important if you have a large team and you don't want to like parse through pages of logs. The cool thing to do is put a date on it, and then put a link to it, which is a hyperlink, which means it's double brackets as far as the syntax. It takes you to another page on the wiki. So for example, Tuesday, March 17, I started the Steam Camp Operations Manual. Click on that and you can see what I've been doing this morning. Uh, so the idea is on a log, don't put this in your log, put a link to it in your log so a person can parse it immediately. Um, so I've done that. Then also I did... Um, global petroleum revenue. I was thinking about renewable energy and, and uh, so I just was surfing the net and, and that's actually an important figure like oil use is still going way up. It's like which made me think like what's peak oil? Like I thought we reached peak oil. Well apparently I don't know there's conflicting information but no like uh, record useful information like is global petroleum revenue relevant to the wiki? Yeah it's it's uh, you know, as we're going to the next economy, we probably want to get to renewable energy as a part. So, so put down anything that you do that's related to the overall goals, like how, like in the future, like I can go into the search box and say like uh, petroleum revenue, and I would find that page, and, and I could look it up immediately as opposed to having to look on the web. So we're trying to distill like all the time. It's about distilling information, so it's more relevant for this specific project. 
So we have to start with the, so, so there's the log and you can literally like on the left hand side there's an index. You, I can literally here I go down to as far as, so the last one is 2017. So for anything that I've done over the last two or three years, I can just control F on my log page and find it in a second, like within five seconds. Like for example, say I was working on a 3D printer extruder. Control F, 3D printer extruder, and I'll, I'll get a bunch of links. And just to emphasize, put don't put a wall of your work here, just put the links to other pages. That's the hyperlinking part. That's a very powerful concept. So, so if you look at my log, you can parse anything that I've done and say, I want to look at your log. Okay, how, how are you doing on a video? Well, I would expect a thing like, uh, say the D3D universal IKEA diagrams or something, whatever you put it, I'll look at Like if I don't know the title, I just go on your log. Mm -hmm. And if I know you, you committed to doing that, mm -hmm. like next Friday's meeting, I'll go to Friday and I'll say, hey, what, what did Ian do? Where is that? And I can find that in seconds. Yeah. So it's, you can have a team of many people. Um, I would say that like for one manager, what's the limit of how many people we can follow? I think it's like Dunbar's number. You, you know that number? So Dunbar's number is the size of a village or the size of people, the number of people that any one individual can know face to face. That's about between 100 and 200. You can say it's like 12 by 12, 144. But that's like the size of a village and it's the amount of people we can actually know face to face before like we completely are, you know, before we are strangers. But I think that applies here. Like if I have a team of my people you know, I think I can handle like a hundred people and I can know exactly what they're doing. And then after that, you would need more like dedicated managers who maybe know like what hundred projects exist. But the point is you can scale that kind of collaboration through this very simple tool. Um, so the idea on the wiki is that's very important. Like just document all this stuff because, and don't worry like, Oh, well, where do I put it? Where am I going to find it? Just, just put it up there so you don't lose it if it's important information because indexing can happen afterwards. Like, say you have a bunch of messy pages, that's the separation between content and its presentation. Yeah. The wiki is a database, yeah. so you can organize it in as exquisite detail as you, as you like. like. Like, all the assets for, like, for example, on a printer, like, they're all scattered all over the place. But if somebody takes HTML, CSS to it, they can organize it into something that looks super professional. And Wikipedia has got a bunch of templates and other things. Um, we have some templates that we use, but you can completely use templates, HTML, CSS. Like, for example, to show you an example of a template, there's this... Uh, um, I remember this one page called Flashy XM for flash mobs. Um, so we did this template. We were kind of experimenting with flash mobs, how we get a bunch of people to working together on a project. Uh, but here's an interface where you would embed different things and structure it. So, okay, we have a video. Oh, yeah, like, look at this. Like, that's an embed of the YouTube. There's, like, a graph of, like, a lot of projects going. It's, I guess all this content kind of went away. But you can embed spreadsheets and other stuff. But basically, you can have kind of like a dashboard where you can yep. see content in an organized way. Uh, and that's why we emphasize the embeddable content, like Google Docs, even Facebook posts or YouTube's, like you can embed, that's like a Google Doc embedded right there. So you can actually click edit right there and you can get into editing it. So all of this is live, editable information, completely alive, not dead. Like that's the beauty of the, the internet. The things keep living. Um, and you can put links to make this very easy to, to work on. Like, for example, if we have a, a Google Slides presentation embedded underneath it, you want to click it, put, put on an edit link so that people can, can edit. But also in the Google Doc itself, open it up to open editable, like by anybody in the world. Um, we do that most of the time because if you're collaborating, it's like it would be a pain to, like, okay, now I'm going to share it with you. Sam or Ian, uh, like too many people, just blanket open it. And cool thing about Google Docs and Wiki, it has a version history. 
don't worry about vandalism. We actually never had vandalism yet over the decade of the project, like where people like go into your document and just like trash it. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. People have other things to do, but even if they do, you just go into the history and you revert the change. So that's how wikis work. They are designed for mass wild collaboration like that. So you guys, so Google Docs, anyone can edit. Yeah, like, like for example, that document, if I were to you know, say possibly it, that, that should link me to it, um, it went to this editable doc, but actually, see there, I wasn't as vigilant about it. I have certain people, since that's kind of like a high level document, like some documents which are high level, like you just want to close up, but most working docs, at least the working docs, you go, there, so there's the share button and in it, you always want to go to like advanced, anyone like change the main permission to say that on public on the web anyone can edit yep. that i'm going to cancel it for now but yep, yep. but that's like the default if you got a working doc you're working things out it's like people are collaborating just just open it up don't, yep. don't worry about it yep. but that's a cultural thing like some people are like oh what's Somebody's gonna trash it. I can't do that. Like people are not used to that. But you gotta get used to the idea that it's okay, and we're all here to collaborate and work together, because the idea is it's like the good old fight of good versus evil. There's probably gonna be more good guys that, like, say somebody sees somebody trash something, they'll fix it. That does work. The idea that when you have like x greater than y, x is the good guys, y is the number of the bad guys. Typically, x is greater than y. If that's the case, the things will go up in quality, not reduce in quality, right? So uh, that's a that's another principle. And going back a little bit to the co the grand coordination of how you um, work together, collaboration protocol. Well, the first thing that we actually got to think about is um, all getting aligned to, to what are we doing here. So the first thing we got to start with is. OSD is working on a global village construction set. We've got these 50 machines that include the 3D printer and many, much more. And the goals there are 2028 is the current. We have a, a critical path document online. You can, you can see that. Uh, but the point is that by 2028, we want to finish all the machines. And anything that I say to anybody is, revolves around that. And, and like the people who join a team, everyone has to be on, on a team to say that, okay, we're doing that. And therefore, if you're in one of the hundreds of schools that universities or the OSC classrooms that want to collaborate, start with that. You know, you have to start with that goal and then you can say, okay, well, that we've got these 50 projects. Do I like something in there? Oh, maybe it's the, the electric car or something like that. Um, so then go at it, understanding that 2028, we're seriously aiming to finish all of this up to, like, what's the le last level of technology? We have up to, because some of the most advanced things are induction furnace, which means you can take metal and get virgin steel sections to build anything, uh, any heavy machine or cars or whatever. The ability to melt steel and then roll it and make wire and make sheet, that's part of the set. That's in there, that's high, hot metal processing, it's in there. And then there's even one even more funky one, which is um, still doable, and that's extraction of aluminum from clay. You got dirt out there. You can make aluminum right here. You can make these printers. They wouldn't be steel, they'd be aluminum. But that's the limit. If you have access to energy, which that's the basic principle, you have 10,000 times more power that comes from the sun that we use today, even with fossil fuels, like fossil fuels which are stored energy over long history, we got plenty of power. So things, crazy things like making aluminum, that's just a bunch of processes. That's like metal vessels, electricity, uh, gears and motors, and maybe some vacuum pumps here and there. And, and there you go. You turn in dirt and twigs into advanced civilization. That's an explicit goal. So it's like, okay, that's, that's getting pretty serious. And it certainly uh, applies to other less habitable places than Earth, like the moon and Mars. Like I actually got a few invitations this year to... To like space conferences, people are saying, okay, well, how do you bootstrap civilization where there's no resources? Well, you got to make them from the rocks and twigs, whatever you got there. Mm -hmm. So those are the goals. So the, making metal, that's advanced civilization. And then making aluminum, that's also advanced civilization. But 
Also, in, um, so those are the formerly the machines, but with all the different machines, like say you've got CNC machining, the ability to make anything from metal, you can then go to other things like how, how about silicon production for solar cells or even microchip production from silicon and some dopants. Like that's all known technology. It's been around for decades. Um, we're saying, okay, well, let's open source that so that like those are like, for example, the chip making, that's like some of the most concentrated proprietary stuff, but it's also very important because it kind of runs our world. So you want to make sure that access to that is open and there are movements like that right now. There's actually an open silicon project out there where they're starting to design their own microchips and uh, using existing equipment that's off the shelf. But at least they're getting to the point where like even the Arduino chip, that's not, that doesn't even exist. Uh, it's all a proprietary, like the, where they make it, uh, how they make those chips, not open source. Uh, so we're not there yet. But it's important because um, a lot of people, like for example, with the microchips, it relates to democracy in the sense that these days a lot of people are putting all these back doors into their chips where you, if you don't know the chip design, you don't know what that chip is doing. So like with things like spying and, and security issues, those are real issues for a lot of people. Like I'm not particularly worried about it myself, but you know, that's my, my feeling on it because I think there's, because we can solve that readily if we open source the designs. That's, that's what I say. It's like, I'm not going to spend time worrying about that. I'm just going to get busy doing the open source version of that so that we have that security, which is going to be a huge value once that does come out. Like everyone's going to want that because you want security. You don't want people spying on you, NSA spying on you or whatever. Uh, so um, that's starting with a big vision. Okay, that's, that's the goals, the Global Village Construction Set finished by 2028. So we've got like eight years. And we're at a time where we're just starting to get some of the enterprises, the steam camps, the printer production. By the summer, we're aiming to produce CNC torch tables and tractors in addition to the larger printers. So we're just moving right along. Um, now, so you, say you have the GVCS50. The other important thing is, is to talk about um, the construction set approach. I, I did a diagram where, where I showed that um, when we make a, say for a, a tractor or like say the, say the printer here, we use the universal axis. It's a construction set in the sense that you can build a different version of that or you can scale it and modify it to make other machines like CNC torch tables or even heavy duty machines when the rods in there are not eight millimeters but like three inches, up to three inches using similar types of geometries. So scalability. Um, construction set approach means that you're build, building basic building blocks and you can do a lot with it. Um, so we, we use that a lot. With the construction set approach comes the ability to produce multiple machines from a small core set like Legos. So that decreases the amount of um, information or skill that somebody developing with it needs to have because you can work with the existing modules to make, like a novice could pretty much take this basic design and for example design the the second z-axis to make it really good for milling, you know. Or you can make the larger D3D Pro with it or larger, like up to like say two feet. With this kind of axis, it's about like you can make about two by two foot print beds, like three quarter meter or something like that. Um, so that's the construction set approach. Now, the engineers could actually redesign the, the modules themselves. They can go deeper into the technology to make better modules Whereas novices can completely work with the modules like Legos to use what's already there. As the novice gets better, they get more engineering skill to do the deeper level of redesign using all open source tools. So um, there's the modularity on the machines. Then what about the modularity on the development process? So we have the 50 machines. We break modularly. We break each one into like a dozen modules. Like you have, you can go. Okay, you got the axes, you got the control, you got the base, you got the extruder. You can further break that down into things like uh, one aspect of the controller, like say the ramps board, controller board. You can break it down into, into saying, oh, well, that's got three different axes and you can develop each axis to optimize it. Um, there's a bed module where you, which you can add things like heat to it or whatever. Or We, we actually have an insulated heat bed in ours. Uh, which is like the only printer in the world that has that for the D3D Pro. 
because we want to save 30% energy on using that. So you can develop at the module level. So after the modules, um, so let me go to actually to the main website. On the main website, I actually talk about the, the modular approach and uh, the modular development. So how do you, uh, so about, about uh, machines development. So on our main website, we'll talk a little bit how, how this development process looks. Well, first of all, you've got construction sets. So we break this down into like tractor construction set, um, universal rotor construction set, ro universal rotors could be things like augers or even wheel drive units. You can have construction sets for electronics, for hydraulics, for electric motors and everything. So break it into a, a generative approach. But then um, more important than that, that's the basic philosophy of it, but then more important than that, you have the breakdown of machines. So you've got a machine, you break it into say a dozen modules, and then for the dozen modules, you go through about 40 development steps, or 20, depending on like how advanced you want to get. So at for each machine, you got say 12 modules, say 20 development steps, uh, 12 times 20 is like 240 right there. You go through several versions of each machine. So there's like three, four, five, I mean, we're up to like seven on, like the power cube and other things. So it's like a thousand items already for one machine that you have to track. If you got 50 machines, you got 50,000 items right there. And you can multiply that even further uh, because technology is one aspect, but the second aspect is actually the, the enterprise development. So there's like way more aspects. But this gets into taxonomy. So what are all the development steps that you need to know? Well, this comes from the standard product development process. I mean, there's standards there are already that anyone who designs products already knows. Like, you gotta come up with requirements, concept, and technical design. Then you got build procedures, you got data collection, you got testing. There's a bunch of different steps that are well known. And we just simply follow those. So, so then how do you find something on a, on a wiki? We follow that taxonomy. So we say 3D printer extruder, this is a sub-module. So you'd have a page called 3D printer extruder fabrication diagram. So on a universal. D3D universal. Um, I know that there, so, so first of all, what happens when I go to D3D Universal CAD? I know that, for example, on this page, CAD is one of the sections here in the index. Yep. So, so you go to D3D Universal and I would put in CAD, so CAD. And the way it works is, uh, spice, so spice enter. Pen. And there is no page, so what you can do here is redirect it to where it actually is. So this is like what we can all do. But if you don't find, if you get a result like this, then go back to D3D Universal, it must be there. So yeah, if you go to D3D Universal, there's a CAD right there. So you click on CAD and you get all the CAD. Um, so this is... And so you know, you see that like you've got the machine yeah. in each module for the machine. Yeah. Uh, where do we, is that sort of shown here? Like, so you've got the x axis, y axis, the x axis extruder. Um, modular breakdown is in the CAD. Like, for example, in the CAD, we have we got 3D printer, printer extruder. So these are all the extruder parts. Uh, so this is all going back from the index. You also have controller. So so under CAD you've got control panel. So you got all the panels, all the parts for the control panel. But like going back to that taxonomy that you're showing, all that workflow has got the modules yeah. for each machine, and then from the module you have the spreadsheet of the things. Yeah. Is there like an example of that? In there is. Where you can sort of see the, the current development of a machine. Yeah. Like the, yeah. 
we we do have so so go for example to that is under the development template page so actually let's go back to the OSC collaboration protocol because I described that there so what I talked about is this is that starter work log we talked about that a little bit um, we also use a little bit of project management so on each development page we would embed like a scrum board where you have tasks and people can sign up to that the t different tasks so that's we were using scrummy uh, which looks like see they just took it down a couple of months ago so we're looking for another scrummy alternative some very lightweight thing you can embed in a website that you don't it's like you don't have to go to another site like on top of uh, we had the last team and we had a scrummy on top where different people were working on different things and you can identify who's doing what so in addition to the log you can have the scrummy which identifies different roles um, so part libraries visual history embed google presentations so for power users this kind of gets into wiki taxonomy so i started discussing this taxonomy of, of the, the 20 development steps so what does the actual taxonomy look like so it's in a development template so uh, i actually have a you can watch this video it shows the naming convention for all projects and the development template where is the development template Oh, let's see. Yeah, so the video describes this, but this is the template, and if you go explicitly through it, it's requirements <coughs> plus value proposition. Like, what are you trying to do here? You know, like with a printer, we want to say, oh, we, we're doing a printer that's got the lowest unique part count in the world. It's scalable and modular, so you can add any different toolhead to it. Like that's part of our requirements, and and it's also um, industrial grade in the sense that you can bootstrap it up to more industrial machines. That's requirements in this. Uh, item two is industry standards. So before we build this, we we study what people have done. So for this, industry standards would be RepRap project. So whatever you start, you better believe there's somebody else that's done it before, and, and it's worthwhile to document who's done something else before. So that's, uh, then you go to conceptual design. Uh, next step is you go to a modular breakdown. So start by, like say you do this project, identify all the modules, just list them out so that you can create, in principle, one of these templates for each of those modules. And you can go through, through a very rigorous process for each module, like if you have the, controller the extruder go through like the requirements industry standards go through the recursion of that for the sub module uh, and I'll get to your question like let's show an example but let's go through an example uh, like what, what this is okay um, so that okay modular breakdown so that means you're, you're allowing many more people to collaborate you got 3d CAD that's obvious calculations like um, say you've got uh, extruder calculations based on the heat input to the extruder this is how much filament we should be able to make m melt per hour and that will get you insight onto extrusion rates and then you can verify that in data collection la later on but you want to start with like okay is that working like oh that may be extruding too slow or not slowing not, not fast enough like you'd be able to get insights from making calculations you can do calculations on a lot of things like including cost calculations, weight calculations, print time calculations. Based on, uh, from your CAD, you can do all of that. Um, electronics design, that's the circuitry. Wiring and plumbing, so like there's the electronics design, like say for the controller board, but the wiring is how you connect everything together. For plumbing, there'll be more for like hydraulics and, and house plumbing systems. Software, obviously there's software. So then you go into the next main section is the bill of materials. So we have a BOM, the main bill of materials. All, all that is found, for example, for the printer. You can look all the parts. There's like, I think 80 or so. 
VBOM, we do a visual bill of materials where we cut and paste images of the actual things. Uh, you can take a look at examples. Each, by the way, you can click on each one of these and it will show you examples. Uh, CAM files, so computer-aided manufacturing files. In our case, that's the G-code files, uh, which if we have a stable version of this exact 3D printer, yes, that G-code file will work for the next printer that's identical. Uh, but in case you have different printers, you need the SDL files to generate the, the manufacturing files from because yeah. yeah. you have different geometries and stuff. Uh, cut list. So cut list is important. If we're making this printer, you say we say, okay, get get uh, six rods that are 12 inches, one rod that's six inches. The board is cut to this length, and there's wire lengths. So you want to list all of that. Uh, next is the build. Build instructions, obviously. Fabrication drawings. So those are more like graphical drawings of how you have one part. Maybe you can cut that out of CAD and show how you have these two parts, they go make this part, and you can do, do like a tree diagram of how it comes together. Um, no, actually that was fabrication drawings. So that's the thing you can get out of CAD, out of FreeCAD, you can get fabrication drawings. Uh, exploded part diagrams, so, so clear diagrams like that. Production engineering, which would be like how do you actually, what tools you use and how do you build it? Like if we build the, the extruder heater block, all I did was a cutoff saw and a drill press. It wasn't CNC and high quality controlled. So um, that's the production engine we've used and we found that this time around, like there's limits to that because we got like 20% failure rate, like one of the five was not working uh, well and the other ones we had to kind of modify. But yeah, like CNC, that would be like the next level production engine where you say, okay, hey, just put this on a CNC mill and this is how you do it, uh, which you can outsource or build in house. There's data collection, so build pictures and videos. You know, for this build, we should have a section on the wiki that does that. Um, data collection, okay, the data collection is like, okay, we've got these, you can measure these, and you can say, oh, okay, on this one millimeter nozzle, we actually got walls that are exactly 1.05 millimeters and stuff like that. A lot of, lot of data, you can collect on everything, like what the issues were in the build process. Um, and then there's future work. So that's the 20 basic ones. Now you can expand that to more like there's um, there's the actually on the very top there is, is the full development template which has got 40 items and you can get more specific. I'm just getting more and more detail. But so now to answer your question, okay, where's an example of that? We have very few examples which where everything is complete because you'll see that this requires hundreds of people. So yeah. So the best we have is, let's show an example. Uh, what's, uh, let's look at the CB, I mean CB press is far along. Um, so for example, um, I think we can find one under CB. Uh, so, let me. See. So let's be true to what I just said. So C B press, press development template. So that should be a page, and if it's not, this is once again I can't not do like fifty thousand of these pages myself. So, uh, but at the C B press development template, um, you know it's only one of fifty. I should have probably done that at some point. Nope, power cube development template. So this is where people can fill it in. So power cube is another one of our machines. Power cube development template. Nope. So let's look at a development template that does exist. What what that tells me? See, there's the la next thing that I didn't mention is how do you version things? Because it may be power cube v1 development template. So maybe that's that's the reason here. Um, t 
template one. Okay. So you'll probably find a whole load of development templates on the wiki. Let's see if we do that. Like, and you can click on them. So I searched for development template one. Uh, I can't find a good one. Like, it's right, so. but the idea is you have versions, and so let me go to versions. How that works? Because that's like what we found is that initially we had um, documentation, and then the wiki kind of collapsed because then a person does the next version. And then you don't know which is which, because versioning, yeah. it's more complex than GitHub. The official way to version it is that you fork the entire project and you start afresh, and that's your version there. Yeah. But yeah, but even on GitHub, that's, that's limited, because you, you don't keep track of genealogy so much. Like here, we actually have very explicit genealogy pages. So for example, 3D printer genealogy, that I can tell you does exist because we keep those up actively. So 3D print, oh, actually let's go to genealogies which lists all the genealogies that exist. So select from that um, 3D printer genealogy. Look at all the versions we've already done. That's what I'm saying. Each one of these would have your full development template. You might find one like maybe, let's see, 1806. Does that have a development template? Um, there it is. And that's what we filled out in that one. We're like completely done with the requirements. Like study of industry standards, I only put two there, two out of ten. You know, it's not really done. Like we didn't study everything. But, you know, we think... Uh, so, so that's how it works, and we even have like we we have a thing where you can embed a burn down. So that's the burn down for this actual thing. It, it parses this thing and it burns it. So it's like we stopped at like forty five percent, and then we carried on in the next versions. But you see, like every time we make a major change, we you, we create a new version. It's already like fifteen versions. So it's like so I'm saying this this requires my thinking right now is like we need those hundreds of chapters. We need like the 2,000 people collaborating in an incentive challenge. And they have to kind of get an idea of this. Let's, let's talk about some of the critical things like, so Wiki Taxonomy, I describe how you can find any page that's, uh, it's, you have to study it. It's, there's versioning where um, there's a protocol of how we do that. So you got to kind of uh, read through this. But there is a, like, if there's like 500,000, I say 250,000 pages, in theory, you should be able to just type in you know, PowerCube version 19.10, which is October of 2019, and then hydraulics. You know, that's one of the many topics. Hydraulics uh, build instructions. Yep. That should be there. Yep. If properly done, I can guarantee you most of this is not done. There's a lot of prominent stuff that is done. Like, like you should be able to find, like, if you want to find a printer, what I would say, go to the genealogy page, look at the last printer, click on that, and then see the, all the assets there. There should be a template. If it's not, start one. So this is like where if everybody has that understanding, by reading Wiki Taxonomy, by reading the collaboration protocol, then you should pretty much be able to do that. And that's, that, that's basically a maintainer, somebody who understands how this is structured and all of that. But a maintainer has to be involved in development because otherwise they're not going to know like, enough about the thing, uh, like what the modules of this machine are. Like, the maintainer has to have a lot of info. They, they should be a developer. So right now it's like the idea is there needs to be thousands of people working on just like Linux. I mean, this is Linux times 100. So that's why it's a mess and we need hundreds of times more people. So that's kind of, but take, do take a look at the collaboration protocol. That's like the main page that definitely leads you to. So there's work logs. Um, we didn't talk much about the FreeCAD, but the technically on the FreeCAD, uh, the part library. So we have a part library for everything that we do. Uh, so. OSC part library. We have a part library for the house, for the 3D printer, for the CNC torch table. So say you go to the 3D printer part library. Um, the basic format is you've got all the parts listed as little things. You've got a file. 
If you click on a file, the FreeCAD file for the frame, you should see a version history. There's only one frame there. Um, but you will see, like, say for this one, FreeCAD, this, this part, the motor piece, you know, we've gone through many iterations starting in 2017, then 2019. Um, but you can download the old version. You can now upload a new version of this. So this has got a built-in version history um, to it as well. But the part library is what we do. Like I, I like to point to the part. So that's the D3D Universal. Um, the part library is what you see there. Each part has got a FreeCAD file and an STL file for printing for the printed parts. Above, what we actually do is this kind of like a visual history where for each part that we did, we kind of like put a snapshot so you can kind of trace how the, the machine was kind of designed all together. So it kind of helps you out to get oriented. Like if, the, if there's like 100 people developing this actively, then I would look at this person and observe like, okay, which new part has been made? If I'm in active development, I can kind of see quickly as opposed to having a wall of like 100 files, you have to read the name and you don't know how it looks, but here we're trying to use these visual histories to do that. But the concept here is a large team, so, so right here on this one module, you can have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 people, 20 people, 30 people, developing all those modules, uploading, downloading, each, each one could have a few people on it, and that's just for one module, then there's the other module, the extruder down here, and there's another module, so already here we've got like a hundred things, hundred people that could be developing actively. Like for example, this is the 3D printed bushing, so instead of the bearings, the linear bushings that we're using, we can 3D print them. We've done that, we're refining them, we're not putting that into the final version because we haven't developed them enough, but you can be developing everything. Like here, for example, Sam, you can now add to this uh, FreeCAD file, like you, you can add like, for example, the digital like instead of the the STL files, you can also add like the, the milling files to that and stuff like that. If someone adds to it, how do you, is there some sort of like quality control? Like does, do you have to, it's, does someone confirm that? Like what, yeah. is, what if they've, you have an updated version but it's actually you have, as good as you? Yeah, you have to look at, um, you have to basically get a peer review or something? Uh, uh, yeah, but the first peer review is the fact that uh, someone who's from outside the project, they're not even going to know this exists. So they're probably already onboarded as a developer, and then they probably are working like coordinating, like say you've got your team here, they're probably coordinating with you, yeah. and you're overseeing that, so you can, they can, they're free to upload it, yeah. but if you're the, the maintainer, you can say, no, nah, I don't really like it, I'm going to revert to the last change. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some management Within the, to it. Within the network, you're saying, hey, this is what I've done, check it out. So yeah. To... See, the way we do it right now here, like, um, you can have pages where the way to address that is you can have, like, the official versions go into the indexed part library, the, the major part library thing. Yeah. Like, um, exactly. like the, the, this one, where, which has the major projects. Mm -hmm. Like, we can, for example, lock this down so only the maintainers would be able to add the official versions and you can have other might be work in progress, work in progress yeah. versions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one way to address that is the person who does that, they put a link on that to their log, for example, oh, yeah. and then the maintainer would say, okay, well, I actually like this. I'm going to just upload it to the main version there. Yeah. So there's different ways to address it, but see, like if you have so many people working on it, the best way to do it is the way we found works really well like there like nobody controlled who put it up but i know that for example michelle and chris were working on that part yeah. and i trust them they yeah. they're going to make good changes like yeah. they're going to print them out and test them and put yeah. stuff on their locks so it's like it's self-managing yeah. but for that you have to have the people that know how to do that yeah. and that's the collaborative literacy for how we get thousands of people working on that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that's kind of the basics and you know can we can be able to like Modify the parts, like um, not really changing the, the, the plan, but doing it in a better way and yeah, it back yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like take photos and put it back. 
Yeah, definitely. Like, like, okay. So for example, like if you've got this, yeah, that's completely doable because like, okay, say you take this part here, the FreeCAD file, and you think like, oh, maybe like I just cleaned up something in the part tree even, like in the FreeCAD file. Uh, feel free to upload it. And then what we can do is just put notes here and say, oh, well, the 13th June version, it's the same as the last one, but it's got this thing cleaned up. If you want the former one for another purpose, just do that. But typically you want to have one on top where... No, I mean, it could be anywhere in there because then the thing is you can index, like say, say the person wants to print out the entire printer the, with the updated parts. You can have another page on the wiki which just lists, links directly to the parts that you need, whereas maybe like this repo here, it has everything in it. So there's different ways to go about it. But typically what we do here is that sometimes I, like typically I just download the latest file, but sometimes I see, oh, that's the file, like the SDF file, which has like four of them nested on a bed. No, I just want the single one because I just want to print one. So you, you look at the, because there's descriptions here or there's notes that people make and you can see, okay, which is which. Um, so, I mean, we're trying to come up with a way that's the least overhead that like anyone could really collaborate. And through the kind of like the wisdom of the crowds, like as I said, like if X is greater than Y, the good guys are num numbered greater than the bad guys. The guys who are trashing stuff are doing bad work. Uh, it kind of works out. It's like a numbers game, but it so far it's worked great. But I mean, we didn't have too many people developing anything, like no more than like a dozen person teams doing anything right now. So we still got to see the next level as we go into the incentive challenge. How do we manage that properly? So um, that's going to be like our next major, major test. And what we're saying is like, what I'm going to do like right now is prepare a bunch of more videos. Like there's a bunch of stuff right now. I think a few few more videos on how do we collaborate effectively, like what the grand vision is, so that the more people know about the principles, philosophy, and where we're going, the critical path. Like there's a few elements you need to know, and then you can just go at it, and, and then it's more or less self-managing. But, but that self-management, is it's expensive. It's, it takes a lot of effort. Like, as I said, Wikipedia spends $30 million a year to manage their contributions. That's their budget, right? So it's not like high, high coordination is not cheap. But here, hopefully, we have a, like a unifying vision. Okay, we're going to do this kernel, this new operating system for Earth, which is, you know, it's not a small task. We're saying, okay, we've got these, this redesign of society for doing stuff in an open source way in terms of its technology base. Um, we're trying to do the best to, to teach it. But as I said, the biggest block is the collaborative literacy, the mindset of people where everyone thinks that you got to get patents and not collaborate to get ahead, which is... Um, one way to do it, but I don't think it's as effective as open source. And I think people will see that over time. Like they've seen it now in software very clearly. And the same is just coming for hardware too. It's just a matter of time. We're not there yet. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So that sounds good. So that's kind of that kind of pretty much covers up covers what we most things that we wanted to take. I requested about this. Yep. I requested a count for Wiki. Yep. 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 Sounds cool. And you can start by just start a log and just keep track by putting links to what you're doing uh, as hyperlinks to other wiki pages. Yep. Cool stuff. Awesome. Uh, any other questions for you guys or any other thoughts? I'll be back in about two hours. Sounds good. Yeah. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's been set up well so that it can kind of run and it's been running so yeah 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 and we're we're evolving it so yeah I'll, I'll stop the recording there's a bunch of resources on I'll link at the bottom of this video uh, to that you can everyone can look at what I was talking about here and go from there thank you for listening <laughs>